اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم محمد وآلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المظلومین واصحابه المنتجبین ومن تبعهم بإحسان الى قیام یوم الدین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل لقدتا من لسان یفقه قولی اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ اعظم اللہ وجورنا وجورکم بمسابنا بی ابی عبد اللہ الحسین علیہ السلام We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us yet again to congregate in the name of his most beloved Imam Hussein the one who ignites our curiosity in terms of the God that he found and how he was able to relieve himself of human frailties how he in spite of the tribulations that he felt, displayed a very virtuous and noble character under situations in which even the most noble's resolve would break and composure would depart. But he, with the surmounting of difficulties, became more radiant and refined in his godliness and humanity. So indeed, there are no words by which to thank Allah and to seek the overflow of his blessing for his beloved Imam Hussein. Now, as we come into this life, we ask a question. Well, what is it all about? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my role in life? Am I supposed to attain something? Is it possible that I can open my eyes in this unending cosmos with such meticulous detail? from a crawling ant to a hundred billion star of gal- hundred billion number starred galaxy. Everything is so perfectly fine-tuned in a perfect balance. What am I to do in this life of mine? What is my purpose? Who am I? Where am I going? What am I searching for? What do I look for? Is it possible that a person awakens in this unending marvel and marvelous and wondrous creation has no purpose? Am I here only to sleep, to awaken, to earn livelihood, to eat, drink, conquer land, and then go away? So many have come before me. They have done the same and they have gone. Their memories have been effaced from the pages of history. I too will face the same fate as they did. What did they take with them? Indeed, what shall I take with me? It is here we, the community of the faithful, are very profoundly blessed by being within the folds of faith in which we have a communication from the one who is our creator, who gives us a sense of life, a sense of purpose, a sense of existence, who gives meaning within a life that otherwise is devoid of meaning. This communication of God to us has come in the form of the Qur'an. Now it would be entirely unjust for the community of the faithful to say that we have a God and we believe in a God and that God has communicated with us and then not to take the opportunity to consult the communication of their God. For indeed, if they admit the one who has authored us and the one who is the possessor of utmost knowledge and the one who has our best interest at heart, indeed, he would communicate to us accurately and tell us what we are all about. Indeed, then if we do not consult with that communication of God, then we are the people who have no one other than ourselves to blame. The Prophet says in the Quran, O Lord, this my community has abandoned the Quran. 
or had abandoned the Quran during their lifetimes. So we revert to the Quran and to see what the Quran says about life, about our purpose. Now, when we look in the Quran, we see that Allah says that your religion, the only way of life that will be successful for you and that will yield accurately is surrendering to me in your entirety. The Quran is extremely adamant. It is unwavering in this regard. It does not want to allow surrender to other than God. You are entirely to turn to me. In there is your purpose. In there you will find your completion. But there is this adamant tone within the Quran from the beginning till the end. Look at the compiled Quran that we have today. It is not in the chronological fashion in which it was revealed, but the form of compilation. And if you look at the chronological one, it will do the same thing. Bism Allah ar Rahman ar Rahim. It begins immediately in the name of Allah, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah. All praise only to Allah. It ends with A'udhu bi Rabbin Nas. I seek refuge in the Lord of man. It begins with God, it ends with God, and in the middle, it denies any worth to other than God. It's a pure monotheistic religion. But we ask God, why such emphasis on monotheism? Why such emphasis on your unity? Why such emphasis on just acknowledging you? We see that the Quran actually responds to that, that the human history has been plagued with polytheism with one or another form of polytheism. And that, according to the Quran, has been a source of distraction from human beings attaining their goal. In one place, Allah says, have you seen a person that owes his servitude to one master, how well directed that person is, as opposed to another one who has several masters, all commanding him to do different things and are always at odds with each other, how confused that slave becomes. He gives the rationale behind this. Why do you need to cut away from all other gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The former scriptures, if you look at the Abrahamic scriptures, they admit to Elohim, gods. They call them gods. It's been conveniently translated as God, but the words were gods. And if you can see the depiction of God within those scriptures, you will see why the Quran is so adamant in denying any polytheism or any form of demigods. Then you look at the Hindu pantheons. You look at the, the Trinitarian theology of the Christians, where Jesus has become one of three, sharing in Godhead. So we see human history plagued with polytheism. And that has been the central problem that Islam sees. And the eradication of polytheism was the full message of the Quran in order for humanity to reach at its completion. When he discusses Abraham, he says, Kana Musliman Hanifa. He was a Muslim surrendered to God. Hanifa upright. Wa ma kana min al -mushrikeen. And he was not of those who committed shirk. This gestures that the early history of humanity was filled with notions of other gods. And that thing has somehow penetrated within our DNA. It is amazing that the Prophet came and he said, do not draw portraits of living beings. Do not carve statues. The emphasis there was so that this notion of sharing with God is removed from other than God. But still, human history bears witness. In one way or another, there is reversion to gods other than God either by the name of God, or lesser gods, or demigods, or people who share in the quality of God. And all of these have been proven to be sources of distraction. The Quran admits. The phenomenal thing about the Quran is it does not lie. It does not hide. It is very open and it admits that there are other agencies other than God who are at play, who are working, and it makes it very clear that they're not God. You can see when you read the Quran that a lot of the times the Quran is talking about grand angels or grand beings. 
who are the agencies at work. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inevitably in every verse reverts the full potency and power only to himself. You see the nuance within the Quran, he the unknown, I the God, Allah am I, he says in some places. All of these, we are there in the Quran. But the bottom line is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you must revert to only me, just see me through it all. Now think about this. The Muslim minds have been incapable of trying to decipher these verses and we have lumped them all within God. And we haven't understood the finer points the Quran is making. The Quran is saying, no, there is a finer story here. Understand that story. But at the level of your commitment and surrender, it's only me. So people say that those verses that talk about features of God, they are all metaphorical. And I beg to defer, how can they be metaphorical? The hand of God is upon their hands. God does not have a hand. This is a metaphor. I will say yes. But what about when God says, Oh Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating to the one I have created with my two hands? Why did he say two hands as opposed to hand? This cannot be rendered to a metaphor. Or why does the verse says, The heavens we have made with hands and we are constantly expanding them. And we find that this is the very case when you look at our cosmos and the nature of the cosmos that it is expanding. Why does he use the word hands in the plural? Why singular, dual and plural? You cannot reduce them into metaphors all the time. And there is a secret in there and we need to explore it. And if Allah gives life in the future years, we can delve deeper into these verses and trying to uncover them. But the bottom line that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets is that you will turn to only me and you will see only me. Now look at the phenomenal tone in which the Quran speaks. It says, had this Quran been authored by other than Allah, you would have found many discrepancies therein. So even though you find different agencies talking, it is authored by God himself. And this Quran is not such that it can be invented by other than God, the verse says. God is not saying, I have authored it, but the Quran is saying it cannot be authored by other than God. So it is admitting to a finer reality to which we need to awaken. Yet it's saying, beyond the shrouds of this finer reality, there is a deeper calling within you, and that is that you turn to one God. Now look at how adamantly Quran at the one hand admits to potency of other agency. It admits to the creative nature of other agencies. And on the other hand, it denies them any worth. It does not accept any demigod status for anyone other than one Allah. It's amazing. Look at these verses. Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. Qul huwa Allah ahad. Say he is Allah the one. Lam yalid wa lam yulad, the end of the surah. He does not beget, beget, nor is he begotten. He feeds all, he is not fed by any, he is uniquely one. So then he says, the people that you call on to other than Allah cannot hear you. Imagine. And if they could hear you, they will not be able to respond to you. And then in another place Allah says, and those martyrs when they die, they say to those who have not died, look at the reward that God has given us, but you can't hear them. So three levels at which he admits three different levels, but cuts off all connection with us. Isn't that amazing? Either they cannot hear you. If they were to hear you, they can't respond to you. If they were to talk with you, you can't understand their response. Subhanallah. Ibrahim says, that you cannot do any wrong to me, to his community, save Allah wills otherwise. And if he wills otherwise, then fine. Isn't it amazing? The God-centric message of the Quran as I build the topic. You know, we do a lot of ceremonies and we find our answers, don't we? We turn to other than Allah and we find answers, don't we? Every faith does the same. Every faith is plagued by this, that we turn to other than God and we find our answers. You know what God says in the Quran? Don't turn to anybody, turn to me. And if I don't solve your problem, thank me and say that is your destiny and I accept your destiny so you grow fully from within.
Can you see this? We normally adhere to our ceremonies to find a response to our difficult situation, don't we? And we find response, what happens? We get cut away from God altogether. Whereas the Quran is saying, if you were to die, you're going to come to me anyway. If you have lost your arm in a war and a battle, then I will give you a handsome reward. This hand was going to go anyway. Isn't it better for you to have your hand cut and find me rather than your hand intact and lose me? Look at the phenomenal message that the Quran is giving. It is not denying the potency in the things that we do. Yet it is saying that it is wrong for you because it defeats your purpose. Turn to me, accept my discretion. Now, I'm going to obviously discuss these themes more thoroughly as the days go on. But look at the way in which the Prophet is being made to say things to his community so that his community may not make a mistake of being distracted through the Grand Prophet himself. He says, on the day when I raise all the prophets, I will ask them, what happened after you left? They will all say, we do not know anything. We do not know anything after you took us away. The grandest of all prophets, amongst the grandest of all prophets, Isa Salamullah Alayhi, the one who blowed into dead people and revived them. He created the form of a bird, blew into it and it became a bird. He is being asked, Isa, what happened? O oh Lord, I was a witness upon them for so long as I was with them. Once you seized me, I have no knowledge. This is the great Isa. The Quran is adamant to convey this message that there is nothing but God. The blessed prophet is being forced, and I will say why I'm using this word forced in the Quran in the later lectures. Prophets say, I do not know the unseen. Say, I have no control. I cannot remove any harm, nor procure any benefit. Say, O Muhammad, I do not know what will be done to me or to you. I am led by the revelation. Say, I do not possess the treasures of God. Am I but a mortal like you, say Muhammad? When they ask you for miracles, climb to the sky and bring down a book and then show us the book within the scrolls, otherwise we will believe not. Say, Muhammad subhanallah, glory be to Allah, hal kuntu illa bashar al-rasula, am I but a mortal messenger? The greatest of them all is being told to relay this message adamantly. Qul, qul, qul. It is as if the, the great prophet has been put under great amount of pressure. Say it, O Muhammad. Think about it. The other prophets were not placed in this kind of pressure that say, but the Quran, look at Surah An'am, Surah Qul, everywhere the prophet is being say, told, say it, deny any divinity to yourself, deny any potency to yourself, give potency and divinity only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teach them to call on to Allah, rely upon Allah, choose the discretion of Allah upon anything else. Muhammad, your task is to convey our task is to hold them accountable. That's it. But we have ziyarat in which we say that all oh, children, grandchildren of the Prophet, the return of the creation is to you and their accountability is to you. The Prophet is being told, deny all of these things. Now that is on the one hand. On the other hand, the Quran unravels a mystery. It says, you who are here today, make no mistake, this is not the beginning of life. There was a life prior to this life. You have made pacts with Allah that you will not worship other than Allah. And these pacts are a heavy pact. You will be brought to account on, the, on account of this pact. There are scribes that are writing every one of your deeds. On the day when the scrolls will be opened and man shall look within it, he will cry out, there is not a great or a small deed, but this book has enumerated it. Mali al kitab. What be with this book? It does not omit anything. You have made a pact. It's a serious pact. It's a serious life. Awaken to it. 
the Quran reminds us that this life is not a real life. It's an illusory life. It's but a moment of enjoyment. It says to us, <coughs> in terms of the hereafter, this life is but an hour, but an afternoon. There is something grand going on, awaken to it. I know what I am doing. God is saying, turn to me. If you turn to me, I will forgive you. If you turn to me, I will complete your journey. But at the same time, he's saying, don't take my word for it. Think within yourself. You have made a pact. You have forgotten. You have been given very little knowledge. If you believe in God, then take these verses very seriously. This is what the Quranic message is. You will be standing before me, accounting for every deed. And the first thing God will say is, call on to those that you called on to in your lifetime. They say, but we do not place them as gods. Nay, we only devote ourselves to them to take us nearer to God. The Quran says, has Allah ordained this for you? Has God ordained this for you? His Quran, from beginning till the end, read it. Has he ordained such things for you? The Quran is putting forward a simple logic. The Quran tells us again that the story of Adam was another story altogether. Adam was supposed to live in a place with his wife Eve. He ate of the fruit and as a result there was a change in destiny. And that is the reason you are all here. Make no mistake, it wasn't Adam, it was all of you. The Quranic tone is quite clear. Ahbatu minha jami'a. All of you exit from here. Lakat khalaqnakum thumma sawarnakum thumma kulna lil malaikat is yudu li Adam. We created you, we fashioned you, and then we said to the angels, prostrate before Adam, you are all there. Just because you forgot or you have forgotten doesn't mean that you did not have something else going on previously. Something else has happened. And if you are true to God and God's word, then reflect upon what God is saying. There was a change in the destiny of Adam. And now you are here and you have to get back. So Allah says, and he who follows my guidance will have no fear. This is the guidance of God, the Quranic perspective. Now, the Quran, in explaining to us Tawheed, in explaining to us our previous pacts, again tells us that religion, this Tawheed religion, is nothing but God orientation. Tawheed just does not mean to say La ilaha illallah. The Prophet said, Kulu la ilaha illallah tuflahu. Say la ilaha illallah and you shall be successful. We know by saying la ilaha illallah we are not successful. But if you look at the initial community of the Prophet, they said la ilaha illallah. What happened to them? From superstitious barbarians who killed and took joy in warfare, who had no sense of human rights but rejoiced in creating human tragedy, they became the exemplaries and led the world. They became the finest human beings, virtuous to the core, moral, noble, people stuck within the lives of a desert, became a nation, a brotherhood, and created a civilization. That was the product of La ilaha illallah. So when God says, turn to me, and only me, it is in order for us to achieve our inner purpose, our greater purpose, and that is the reason the Quran wants to cut away other than God in order to fulfill our destiny within us. Now, God calls himself the friend. He calls himself the light. He calls himself the forgiver. He calls himself the benevolent. This turning to God is supposed to ignite all of this beauty within us so that we come to completion of our inner godly light. And how beautiful was the deen of Muhammad when he supplied it. Today I get faced with so many questions that if we were to undermine our ceremonies, what will we do in its place? Because people are accustomed to it. Before I respond that, think about it. When the pandemic came, all our ceremonies were cut off. How did we spend the last one and a half years of our lives? In fact, it shifted the paradigm. We enjoy the new lifestyle more than the previous one. 
That is a non-starter, that question, what will we do in its place? Those ceremonies are possibly restrictive. They are taking away the time that we need to ourselves to reflect, to learn, to evolve, to meditate. Those ceremonies maybe are chipping away at life in a very unwholesome manner. Constant ceremonies, this is what the Meccans were involved in. They used to go in a state of consecration from behind their houses because they couldn't go from the front houses because they were wearing ihram. The Quran simply says, there is no good in entering your houses from the rear door. Go from the front door. Goodness is in the piety that is within your chest. The Prophet came and he removed all the ceremonies. He made religion minimalistic. He said, religion is God orientation. You spend your time with God. He institutionalized five prayers. Now imagine if a person prays five times a day diligently with proper focus. Imagine how directed they would become. Imagine if a person reminds himself, Alhamdulillah, Rabbal Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the one who nurtures the whole of the worlds and then examines the world. Imagine how fulfilled that individual's life will be from within after encountering that solitude within a meditative state and reflection, nobody will want to engage within a societal life more than what is necessary. Imagine how substantive life becomes. The Prophet introduced God at the hell of human existence. He says, do everything for Allah. Let your breaths be breathed in the name of Allah. Go and visit the sick. Be altruistic. Explore the world and nature. Find cures. He empowered. So the verse says of the Quran, He came to you. He instructed you. Thereby, He broke the shackles that tied you and lifted the veils that pinned you to the ground. What were these shackles? What were these weights? They were none other than the pagan ceremonies and the rituals that they had. And all these ceremonies and rituals, although we see them as bad, but in, they were institutionalized well through well-meaning high hearts and minds as forms of devotion to God. But then ceremonies became ceremonies and they led to the loss of the essence of their religion. So the Prophet came and gave a religion in essence. And the form was secondary. He cut away all the ceremonies. Now, if we were to look at the Quran and examine it, subhanallah, it is a great shame that Quran has been ceremonialized and in so doing, we have trivialized the Quran. It is being recited in the month of Ramadan for Thawab. We recite Yasin when somebody dies. The reciter doesn't know what they're reciting. The listeners are on their mobile phones. This is how trivialized it's become. Is it not true? Is it not true? Back in the day when I used to be a smoker, I used to go out when the Yasin was being recited. Isn't it so shameful? It's the heart of the Quran, but it means nothing. This is what ceremonializing things does to those things. It devalues them. The meaning goes. But if we were to read the Quran, look at the phenomenal things within the Quran. Look at the nature of the cosmos within the Quran. It's subhanallah. Subhanallah. The Quran says, Noon wal qalam wa ma yasturoon. Noon and the pen and what it inscribes. We are saying, what does that mean? Tur wa kitab al mastur fi rikkin manshur. Tur. The inscribed book within scrolls laid open. Now, until here, we will not understand what it means. Then we come to that verse. The day in which we fold up the heavens as the scrolls of records are folded up. As we initiated the initial creation, we will cause it to return. We say, subhanallah, is this the nature of creation? That it is but a scroll that is being written. And this is just an animation of something that has been written. And this animation is being animated right now. Then go back into the Quran, look at every verse. The sky on that day shall appear frail. 
be frail. The heavens shall be folded up on that day and he will hold it in his right hands like a scroll. Imagine. This is the cosmos that God is pointing to. The real state of our universe that is unending. The heavens shall be cleft asunder. The sun shall be folded up. The stars shall diminish their lights as if the sky, the firmament, will just be peeled away. Subhanallah. And on that day you shall see angels surrounding the sky. It will appear like molten copper. It is pointing at such a profound, profound reality. Please look and spend time looking at the latest scientific discoveries about cosmology, about virtual reality, about a virtual universe. And then reflect again upon the nature of our existence. It is a very illusory existence in which something very grand is at st stake. Then look at the Quran, the creation of the earth and the heavens. It's so meticulously accurate. Look at the beginning of life. We have created everything from water. From there were creatures that crawled upon their bellies. Others took, took to two, others took to four legs. This was all said 1,400 years ago. The Supreme One does not wish to hide anything within the Quran. The Quranic perspective is explore, understand the nature of reality and the structure of reality. Let your imagination take flight in the outer world. Control the domain of the universe in the inner world. Complete your godly journey and become virtuous and moral people. But out of all of this Quran, what have we taken? Think about this. What have we taken? We have a theology that we want to prove and therefore we handpick or cherry pick verses from the Quran. Isn't that what we do? We don't read the Quran. We read the verses that suit us. And that's all we do. So we have, Ya amanu, Jahidu fil haqqa jihadi wabtahu ilayhi wasila O you who believe, struggle in the way of your God and seek a wasila to God. And we read that verse. And then we justify the whole theology of tawassul. And the religion becomes overly laden with tawassul at the expense of turning to God. Isn't that so? Most of us will know this verse. How many of us knew the verse? Yoma natwis samak sijil lil kutub. How many of us knew that verse? How many of us knew the verse? Was samawat matuyatun bayamini? The heavens will be folded up in his right hand like a scroll. How many of us reflected on that verse? How many of us reflected on the verse of the beginning of life from water? How many of us have seen the history that the Quran curiously opens for us? Or the notion of demigods that have gone prior to us? Are we attentive to it? We will cherry pick and see only those verses that we need to prove our theology, our outlook, and our way of life. Now even in those verses, if we were to reflect a little bit more, we will see they do not necessarily mean what we are thinking. Think about this. The whole of the Quran is filled with Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only turn to Him. There is one verse of Wasila, but the one verse of, verse of Wasila takes precedence over all the Tawheedi verses. Is that coming through? The Quran is filled with Wahdaniya. There is one verse of Wasila. We seem to not read all of those verses that talk about the unity of God, but we uphold the word verse of Wasila. Something is amiss in the way in which we are seeing things, in the way in which we are reading things. Now, we ask, at the time when the Quran was being revealed, who was the Wasila? How did the Prophet understand this verse? How did the Sahaba understand this verse? How did the Ahlul Bayt understand this verse? Did they, went, did they start ceremonies with Prophet as the Wasila? We don't find any historical record for that. Imam Ali doesn't do that. Imam Hassan doesn't do that. Imam Hussein doesn't do that. Bibi Fatima doesn't do that. Salamullah alayhim ajma'in. 
So they did not understand wasila in the way we understand wasila. Can you see this? So the wasila has to mean a broader reality. Seek a means. What means? Any means that brings you closer to God. That brings you closer to the tawheed of Allah, the monotheism of God, the oneness of God and you turn fully to God. That is the wasila, whatever it is. Now I will say yes, the Prophet is also a wasila. The Ahlul Bayt are was wasail and wasila for sure, undeniably. But look at how we have misread the verse. In the context of the whole of the Quran, the wasila verse can be explained very easily. Indeed, you have a prime example in the Messenger of God. So the Messenger of God is a wasila by his exemplary nature. That be like the Prophet. Being like the Prophet will make you like the Prophet. At the core and the center and the essence of the Prophet is godliness. We have understood wasila is what? That if we turn to the Prophet and his family in the way that we are accustomed to, we will get paradise. Whereas the message of the Quran is, if you turn to the Prophet, you will become godly in yourself and that is the meeting with God. Look at the way we have twisted it. That if we say to take the name of the Prophet and his family in wasila, we will get paradise. Whereas the Quran is saying, لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ akhar. Indeed, you have a prime example in Prophet Muhammad. For the one who wishes to be with Allah. And in the, on the final day, the paradise comes second. The first thing is Allah. So wasila here means acquire the attitude of the Prophet. The reliance of the Prophet on Allah. The devotion of the Prophet on God. That is what wasila is in the Quran. Become like the Prophet and you will become God like. Now look at the Quran, how beautiful the Tawhidi message is. Alhamdulillah, Rabb al Alameen. Malik Yawmiddin. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Malik Yawmiddin. The sole owner of the day of accountability. We have a hadith, and a lot of orators narrate this hadith. Ali Malik Yawmiddin. That Imam Ali is the owner of the day of judgment. Now for people who are very naive and who sit and listen to lectures when this narration is told to them and it's attributed to the blessed sixth Imam or one of the Imams, at the first instance they find, might find some resistance within it, within their hearts. But you continue re repeating this and various different people repeat it, what happens? Yes, Ali is the Malik Yawmiddin. Can you see this? And then the whole message of Tawheed in the name of the greatest monotheistic Imam Ali is lost. And then what, what happens? Well, I'm with Ali, alayhi, I have no worry on the day of Qiyamah. It is like you saying, I know the person who watches me whilst I give the example, I, I, whilst I give the exam, I have no problem. He can't pass you. He can't pass you. You have to learn and pass your own exam. If anything, learn from the examiner. Learn from the one who is keeping an eye on you, your teacher. Learn from him. Being friends with the teacher will not make you pass. The teacher has no control. If you don't have the aptitude, you will simply not pass. But these sort of ahadith have defeated the central message of the Quran. The verse, and the heavens and the earth will be in his right hand, folded up like scrolls. Further says, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا and the earth will shine gloriously with the light of its Lord. The hadith says, the earth shall shine with the light of Ali. Now, which mind will not be distracted from the, from the message of Allah and from the message of Tawheed? It makes us complacent, it makes us lazy. But the biggest problem is that we get physicians, academicians, Astronomers, engineers, educationists, teachers, they do brilliantly well, exercise their minds, explore the galaxies. But when it comes to religion, they just switch off. And I've seen this amazing thing that there is a naivety within the minds of the believers and the faithful. The Christians have produced some of the best scientists, but they find no objection in God having a son. 
Can you see this? The Muslims have produced some of the finest people ever and the scientists. But when it comes to religion, the minds are switched off. The great problem that the Prophet pointed to was that the Quran is saying, on the day of Qiyamah, there will be no friend for a friend. The day in which a man shall flee from his brother and his mother and his father. The Quran is saying nothing. Leave me and the one I have created, Wahida. Leave me and the one I have created alone. There is no other than Allah on that day. In the name of the greatest monotheist himself, we have lost out on the message of Tawheed itself. These are the crises and the problem is that is this naivety excusable? Will we be excused for this naivety? On the day of Qiyamah, they will say, Oh Lord, we followed our elders and we followed our Sadat. Sayyiduna wa kubara'una, Sadatuna wa kubara'una. We followed our chiefs and we followed our elders. Allah will say, so now enjoy their fate with them. They were wrong. You should have used your minds. The book was in front of you. Why didn't you read it? That was my communication. You believe that that was my communication. Why did you not read it? Do you really think you are here to do tawassul and not glance at the mighty sky and observe the majesty of God and try to discover God himself? Did you think your life was so meaningless? Quran further explains, it is fully against disunity. It is fully against sectarianism. It finds every excuse to forge greater bond on common grounds. The Prophet is told, and those people who have divided their religion into little groups, O Muhammad, lasta minhum fi shay. You are nothing to do with them, O Muhammad. I absolve you of them. The Quran further on says, your hearts were disunited. Through my benevolence, I have united your hearts. Unity of the human community is a bestowal from God. The Quran further says, O Muhammad, call on to the people of the book to come to you in congregation and unity on that which you hold collectively together, namely the worship of one God. The Quran is constantly trying to forge unity on the basis of God. In one place in Surah Zukhruf, I believe the Quran says, if humanity was one, then we will make how roofs of gold for those who disbelieve in God. If humanity was one, even those who disbelieve, we would lavishly bestow upon them. The Quran is forging unity and ties on every excuse with humanity at large. Look at the verse of the Quran, fight them until they resist fighting. If you've made a pact with them, honor their pact. It's constantly encouraging for peaceful, harmonious coexistence. The Quran gives a beautiful religion that is perennial. It gives salvation on the basis not of the Prophet, but on the basis of believing in Allah and doing righteous deeds. It omits the Prophet altogether. That is what the Quran is all about. Now the Quran states that when you believe in something and when you commit yourself to something, it has to be based on knowledge. If it is not based on knowledge, it is worth nothing. Now I ask here, how much of the religions of this world are based on facts that can be ascertained? Can the Hindu pantheons and gods be ascertained factually? Can the Trinitarian theology of the Christians be ascertained factually? Can majority of our Islam be ascertained factually? Allah is saying, resist, don't commit yourself. But when it comes to the Quran, we can say, this is the Quran. Now we can contend against each other on the basis of its interpretation. But at least there's a verse here, look, it might be indicating upon this. The Quran is saying, don't talk outside the realms of knowledge. And then the Quran further states, no matter how grand and sophisticated the conjecture may be, 
it does not avail from the truth in the least. Only commit yourself to that which is established through knowledge. Now, the two greatest problems that we encounter as Muslims, Shias and Sunnis, is Hadith literature and history that cannot be established. This has been the greatest calamity upon our heads. The series of talks that are to come now will be examining pivotal issues within Muslims that shape our outlook and inform us of our theology. Think about this and I will repeat it again. On the assumption that Jesus was crucified, you have the spin-off of resurrection, of redemption, of trinity. One event that cannot be established has snowballed into a whole theology and has made Christians exclusivist that he who does not go through Jesus will be condemned. But Quran is saying that event in itself is not established. And the whole of Christianity is created and based on an event that the Quran says did not happen. This is the fate that we have suffered. So in the lectures to come, we will discuss our fundamental issues in light of the Quran and reason. I firmly believe that the religion of the Prophet Muhammad, the Quran and the family of Prophet Muhammad are so supremely exemplary and noble that if they were to be represented accurately, the whole of humanity can potentially flock to them and find meaning through them and purposeful existence through them. But the way in which we have gone about our religion has undermined the Quran, has undermined Islam, has undermined the Blessed Prophet, and has undermined his family. As opposed to them being people that unify people and bring the best out in them, they have been made a point of factions, sectarianism, and disunity. And that is the greatest injustice that we have done over Sunnis and Shias over the last 1,400 years. Now, as I finish today's talk, think about this carefully. And I often do this deliberately. I mention the names of the wives of the Prophet, Bibi Aisha. And I can see the resistance and the struggle in the eyes of my audience. I said, Hazrat Abu Bakr. But I know full well that they don't know anything about them anyway. All they know is what they've heard from the pulpit. But can you see what it does to us? So now, did we know that the patronage for knowledge was by the later Banu Umayya, Caliphs and Bani Abbas? who allowed for the transmission of Greek knowledge into Arabic and then further on it went back to the West and everything evolved and bloomed and crystallized. We don't. Do you know why? Because we hate the Bani Umayya and we hate the Bani Abbas. We don't know about the glorious history of Islam, their exploration, scientific technology, discovery, their observatories. We don't know. Why? Because Bani Abbas, we hate them. They were the enemies of our Imams. Can you see that? We hate them, so we are deterred from listening to them. We are deterred from looking at them. We are deterred from entertaining their name. Even their names have become repulsive. Isn't it? Imagine the shock of the audience when they find out that our Imams named their children Abu Bakr and Omar. That they may have named their children Muawiyah. Imagine the shock within the minds of the audience at that point. This is how naive the community is. This is how our minds have been twisted. This is how we have been directed. And this is how we have been cheated from an opportunity of life in the name of religion. Whereas the West, we look at the BBC documentary about Islam and we say, wow, have the Muslims invented all of these things? The scientists, optics, clocks. 
but we don't know them. Why? Because they were in the time of Bani Abbas. Oh, they are Sunnis. Eh, Sunnis are our enemies. I'm going to be very open and blunt. The Sunnis see the Shias are our enemies. We don't want to read them. This is what's become, right? Unfortunately, this was the very attitude that Bani Umayyah created in their following against the Imams. That when Imam Ali was assassinated in the mosque, the people could not believe it. They said, what was a drunkard doing inside the mosque? This was their take. They would come to Medina, to Imam Hassan, and they would just swear and curse at him. Why? Because of the propaganda that Bani Umayyah had fed them. Imam Zul al Abidin is found in the streets of Sham, tied and enchained. They said, but you are the enemies of God. You are kuffar. This is what it does to the minds. When Hussein ibn Ali Alayhi was being killed, you do know that there were many there who felt that he has risen against the caliph of the time. And that's why he needs to be put to death. And that's why you find some of the Wahhabi scholars justifying the actions of Yazid. But when it comes to Bibi Aisha fighting Imam Ali, they find excuses. When it comes to Muawiyah fighting Imam Ali, they find excuses for Muawiyah. These are the double standards that plague us. Both sides are no better off than each other. All of their minds and our minds have become plagued, unfortunately. Muawiyah dies, leaving Yazid with final words that I have secured pledge of allegiance for you from the majority of the renowned people of the Ummah, save for three, Hussein ibn Ali, Abdullah bin Omar, and Abdullah bin Zubair. Of these three, Abdullah bin Omar, who you'll find as your ally, if you treat him well. Abdullah bin Zubair, cut him up. As for Hussein ibn Ali, do know that he will come in revolt against you if the people of Iraq can persuade him, but do not bring any harm to him. He was very shrewd, Muawiyah. Muawiyah dies. Yazid dispatches a letter to his governor in Medina and his cousin Walid bin Utba bin Abi Sufyan. He said, extract the Pledge of Allegiance from Hussein ibn Ali. Imam Hussein was called at night to the office of Walid. Imam turned to Abbas and Akbar and the children of Hashim. Come with me. I fear for my life on this night. If you hear my voice being raised, await not, come to my aid. Walid reads the content of the letter of Yazid and says, Muawiyah has died. Imam Hussein pronounces the words of Istirja, inna lillahu wa inna lehi raji'un, as was his custom. Walid says, Yazid demands pledge of allegiance from you. Imam said, would you not rather put this question to me in public tomorrow in the light of the day? Walid said, indeed. Imam said, then let me leave. Walid said, indeed. Retreat to your house. Marwan was with Walid. He said, Walid, if you let him go now, you will never find him again until much blood is spilt between you two. Take the oath of allegiance or behead him. Imam Hussein startled, moved back from his position. He said, how dare you threaten my life? As he said this, the grand youth of Bani Hashim entered in a rage. Walid and Marwan were shocked. The Imam turned to the youths and Abbas and he said, calm. They returned home. The Zakirin say, when Hussein said to Zainab, Salamu alayhima, that prepare for our departure, she looked at him and she said, Indeed, the promise shall come to pass. And then she began to weep. She might have said, O oh Abbas, did you not go for his aid? And Abbas wept in rage. It is said, that Imam Hussein that night went to the grave of the Prophet. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I do not wish to depart from your grave, from the sanctity of your precinct. Alas, if I do not, they will spill my blood. And I do not wish to violate the sacred, sacredness of your town with the spilling of my blood. He lamented 
and fell asleep. And he saw the Prophet, when the Prophet said, oh, Hussein, come to me. I have prepared all of this for you. I await you, O oh child. Hussein said, O oh, grandfather, ask God to bring me to you. The Prophet said, O oh, Hussein, you will first have to sip the bitter sip of death. Allah la'anatullah al qawmin zalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladheena dhalamu wa yamun qalami yanqalibun ilahi na nasabuka bihaqti al-Husayn wa jaddihi wa bi wa ummihi wa khi wa tis'ati al-ma'sumina min durriyatihi wa banin Allahumma aghfir lana dhunubana wa kaffir anna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'al amrar Allahumma ajjil faraj imamin al-muntadar wa jalna min ansarihi wa awani wal-mustashhadina bayna yadayhi rahmallah man qara al-fatiha